So I'm going to crack on. So what we're talking about today is branding. It's uh, branding to grow your complimentary medical business. So what I'll do is I'll actually share my screen. Okay, so that's the one we want there. All right, and theoretically, you should be able to see the screen and you should still be able to see me and possibly Roberta as well and some of your colleagues. So um, what, we, what came up in the chat last week was uh, the idea that we were looking at setting up courses online, which is fantastic for now, but it's also really important for helping you to um, expand your offering um, for when we are in a post-COVID situation. Now, none of us know when that's going to be, but by the same token, um, you know, the virus will mutate at some point uh, to be less transmissible between humans. We do know that, this is what viruses do. Um, you know, if that didn't happen, for example, you know that 1918 flu that killed 50 million people plus worldwide, that then kind of just went into abeyance and then it flared up a few times and of course last time in uh, 2009. Um, and then it went down again. And this is what happens with viruses. They, they flare up, they go down, they flare up, they go down. It has all sorts of things, all sorts of reasons behind it. So setting ourselves up now for a post-COVID situation. So what we've got to be really clear about is how we brand our offering. Um, what I mean by that is what is the identity that we want to put out there? What are the feelings that we want people to, pe to engender in people uh, about our businesses? Um, so let's show you a little bit about what I'm going to be giving you today. Um, my goals today are to give you an overview of branding, uh, key concepts I would like you to consider, and uh, best practice, of course, and also, um, I want you to have a solid foundation that will enable you to build a brand, um, dramatically improve your brand recognition. Um, hang on and, and retain existing clients. So I, I creating brand loyalty for your offering and also to acquire new clients. Specifically, what I really want to do is, uh, is to begin by starting to look at brand stories which ones have taken the world by storm and which ones frankly haven't. And you're going to learn today what works and why and what doesn't. And we're going to be looking at some of the absolute giants in advertising to understand exactly what, what goes on and why. Um, we'll then take a look at what you can do with your business to harness the mighty power of branding so that you can fully differentiate your complementary medical business from all the other Me Too businesses out there. What do I mean by that? Well, if you're a nutritionist, um, you could just call yourself a nutritionist and there may be a nutritionist down the road and there may be a nutritionist over the road and there may be a nutritionist uh, around the block. We're all doing nutrition or in my case, we're all doing homeopathic medicine or we're doing mind body medicine or lifestyle medicine. Um, so the point is that we have to have a way of differentiating our offering so that we really stand out from the crowd. And that's very much to do with branding. You're going to learn how to establish your brand values today and convey these effectively so that you can really um, explain what you have to offer and how your offering can actually help people. Um, we're also going to touch on pricing. Now, I will be honest with you, pricing is a tutorial all by itself. It's such a complex issue, but we're going to touch on it today and values. And we're going to be talking about how to stop commoditizing your services and how you ought to uh, position or structure your own pricing structure so that your clients correctly value you and your services more. So let's have a little look at the difference. Um, you know, branding is a really interesting thing. I find it endlessly fascinating. I can just totally geek out about it. So don't get me started on branding or fonts at a party because I become the most boring person in the room because I just like really get drilled down into it all. It's just so exciting because it actually is because it's so much to do with about neurology. It's about the way that we think it's about social compliance. It's about sociology. It's actually a massive, massive topic, um, which is endlessly fascinating. So of course, you know, we all know that beautiful diamonds just come from um, altered carbon. That's essentially what they are. The fact of the matter is that there are more than enough diamonds to go around the world, um, plenty, plenty of them available. Um, but uh, you know, 
What's interesting is that the diamond merchants, the De Beers and, and all the rest, very, very carefully control the supply of diamonds. And they also advertise and promote the idea that these things are these unbelievably exclusive, desirable things. And uh, that, you know, that we should all, for one reason or another, want them. Well, whether they're your bag or not, not my bag, but if they're your bag, or it doesn't really matter. But the point is they have a cachet, even though there's something that just simply exists out there and they are there's more than enough to go around so I wanted to talk to you about successful brands and brands that uh, really took an absolute nosedive so I want to talk to you first about the difference between Chanel and Charlie they both but now let me just bear with me one second everybody I'm going to just quickly go into the I'm going to admit more people into the room that's it. Yes, yeah, so there were more in the waiting room. So I'll just keep clicking admit or that's fine. So I will do this periodically. Okay. Um, there we go. Right, let's just get rid of that. All right, lovely. So the point is that we've got two mega brands here. The first brand being Chanel. As we know, Chanel is desirable, it has cachet, it's synonymous with luxury. In fact, it is known to be the world's leading luxury brand, according to most researchers. Um, and then you've got Charlie. Now, Charlie was actually um, conceived back in the uh, late 60s, early 70s. Um, and as you can see, it's got a sort of uh, a casual feel to it. The Charlie girl was very modern. She'd be striding across the street in a pantsuit, in a trouser suit, as we call it over here. It was the first time a woman was ever shown in advertising wearing a trouser suit. Very interesting. So that's what they, they were looking at women's lib, as it was called back in the 60s, 70s. They were taking a nod to um, women's um, emancipation, women's freedom, the career, the idea of the career girl, the go-getter. She can be single, of course, you know, everybody embraced the pill. So, you know, women had power. So this is what Charlie was all about. Now, I remember wearing Charlie perfume in the 70s at school. Every girl in my school wore Charlie. It was inexpensive, it was accessible, it actually smelled really quite nice. Um, and that really kind of devalued the brand. It became a brand that was then sort of synonymous with schoolgirls in the 70s who really had no two, no, you know, no, no hate knees even to run together, to rub together. Um, and of course, obviously, the idea of Chanel was absolutely way, 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 way beyond our, our ken um, and our pocket at that time. Now, so what actually happened? Now, the, the thing about these two, these two objects, if you like, or these two products, is that they're both actually fundamentally the same, aren't they? The only thing that differentiates them is, is the branding and the idea behind the brand. They're both probably 99.9% .9 water with some alcohol with some, some scent in them. That's all they are. They're exactly the same thing, but presented in a different way. So you get the idea of, of uh, positioning. Okay. Now, what happened was that Charlie, as I say, kind of fell on hard times because it had been adopted by little schoolgirls. And so Charlie started innovating and they started producing Charlie Red. So that was originally Charlie Blue because it was on a blue box. They like Charlie Red, Charlie White, Charlie Silver, Charlie Gold. And they just were losing the plot and they just couldn't get that brand value back because the brand had been devalued. So what did they do next? Well, they did an even worse marketing decision, branding decision. They inter <laughs> introduced Chaz for men. <laughs> Now, if you don't think that's funny, um, I really don't know what, because I think it's hilarious. So this, it gets even funnier, because look at this. <laughs> they were struggling so hard to sell Chaz cologne for men, that they had to even try to give away a $50,000 Lotus Turbo Esprit with some dude, I can't even see who that is, actually lounging on the car. It's some film star from back in the 70s. Um, but this, the, the, uh, <laughs> the, uh, the, the, the writing here is there's something about Chaz that just seems to go naturally in fast cars and vice versa. So it's only logical the grand prize in the Chaz dream machine sweepstakes should be a tur Lotus Turbo Spree. My goodness, they were trying so hard. But you know what, Chaz disappeared, rightfully so. 
Um, so really, the message is that if you allow your brand to become devalued by positioning it incorrectly, your brand, no matter how good the product is, because let's not forget, Charlie, the original, did smell really, really nice. So nevertheless, it was the brand that got devalued. Let's talk about, I wonder if you can work, right, here we go. Do you remember this one? I'm going to play it for you, because, and there's a reason why we're going to look at this. Just take a moment. Okay, so what's the point of showing you that? Bear with me one second. Right, let me pause him. Okay, that advert was the most successful advert as far as brand recall is concerned and people's enjoyment of an advert ever in British advertising history. And I was looking down at, the, at, at your, I can see your screens there, and everybody's literally sitting there smiling. It was an amazing ad. But the problem was that just prior to that ad coming out, a few years prior, Cadbury's had had a massive problem because um, their, their product, the milk that they were buying in from China, had been contaminated with formica. If you remember, do you remember the baby milk in China that was contaminated with formica? That was, it was a horrendous problem. Poor little babies uh, got terribly ill. Many of them died with terrible kidney problems. And Cadbury's um, dairy milk had been contaminated with the same formica. So they had a PR disaster, a branding disaster on their hands, okay? And uh, so they had to do something. And so they had to go back to kind of what the brand values were. And so what we're trying to really grasp today is the idea that the creator of that advert said, a brand needs to go to the heart and not to the brain. Gorilla is in those 90 seconds trying to take you somewhere. That advert's nothing about chocolate, is it? It's a gorilla sitting at a drum set, but he's been waiting for that moment all his life. And you can see, he takes that deep breath in and you know, it's, and it just almost gives you goosebumps because you kind of really identify with how good he feels. And so what happens is that somehow our neurology um, alters such that we adopt and we are, our mirror neurons actually start to empathize with his feelings. And so by associating it with Cadbury's, we then have those same tr feelings translated over to the idea of Cadbury's dairy milk. So the point with branding is we're not selling a product, we're selling an idea or a feeling. The guy who created, uh, who, who actually briefed the agency, he said, the brief I gave the agency was eating Cadbury's chocolate makes you feel good but this is the key it makes you feel good so we're going for feelings we're not talking we're not talking about benefit uh, we're not sorry we're not talking about selling a bar of chocolate because there are loads of me too products out there loads of me too brands we're talking about feelings okay so that's one step there the next ones i wanted to look at was again probably the world's most successful advertiser ever of course coca-cola 
Um, they've had so many interesting developments in their branding over the years. But again, it's all about the feeling. So I'm going to show you some of these. Now, obviously, they could, wouldn't, wouldn't have been able to uh, license a picture of Elvis to promote Coca-Cola. So they've done a graphic that is very obviously Elvis Presley, the king of rock and roll. They don't make them like they used to. We do. So again, that's an appeal to the fact that Coca-Cola is still the same product after all these years. So who next? Oh yeah, so Marilyn Monroe. Uh, it's uh, now this is hiding. I don't know if you can see this side of the screen um, or if you're just are you seeing right there will be one second. Let me just see if I can make this a little ah okay. All right, let me just move that down. It says I've kissed Marilyn, right? So again, that's the bottle kissing Marilyn. So that bottle is very, very cool. If you're the kind of bottle that can kiss Marilyn Monroe, then you're kind of a very interesting bottle. Let me pop this up there. Right, okay. And then, oh, this was the Saudi Arabia um, launch of Coca-Cola just after Saudi women got permission to be able to drive cars. Look at this woman out in her car by herself, positioned with a bottle of Coca-Cola very, very prominently front of screen. They're also selling the lifestyle here. Look at this advert. It's very interesting because Clearly, the lady is wearing the red and white of the Coca-Cola livery. But look at that sun on her hair and the fact that the breeze is blowing her hair. It says here in very small writing, I don't know if you can see it, it says Coca-Cola, taste the feeling. OK, so the feeling is, well, it's obviously it's summertime, there's freedom. There's a lot of space between her arm and her body and the background. There's nothing discernible in the background. It's very airy, that photograph. So it's giving us, again, a, a feeling of freedom. This uh, can is branded up, love is the way. Here we go. This is from the uh, late 60s, early 70s. For extra fun, take more than one. There's no mention of a drink. There's no mention of a refreshing drink even in, in this advert. But look at this lady. She's obviously tall, she's slim, she looks fit. She's obviously going to the beach or going swimming somewhere. She's, um, you know, she's, she's aspirational in many ways. Again, wearing the red of the Coca-Cola livery. So again, it's all about fun. It's not about a drink. Uh, again, more fun at the beach. Come on, let's have a Coke. Um, ah, right from the very, very beginning. Um, Coca-Cola was the ideal brain tonic. Delightful summer and winter beverage, specific for headache, relieves mental and physical exhaustion. Well, of course it did. It contained cocaine. So, you know, hey-ho. <laughs> and uh, the very, again, very old advertising. Sold everywhere in glass or bottle. Delicious five cent Coca-Cola relieves fatigue. The most refreshing drink in the world. And finally, they even hijacked Christmas. I don't know if you know, but before Coca-Cola uh, branding came along, Christmas and Father Christmas was usually depicted wearing green, you know, the old man of the forest. Uh, Coca-Cola decided to dress Father Christmas up in red and white to match their branding livery. And as such, they actually managed to hijack Christmas. That's a heck of a powerful brand. Right, okay, let's see now, a bit like Charlie, let's just take a little look at how you can really mess up a brand by trying to be cute, by trying to be clever, even by getting a brand representative, Carl Howman. He was in a, a program in the 70s called Brush Strokes, and he was a cheeky chappy, and he's always a little bit kind of pushing his luck and so on and so forth. Watch this video because it's a lesson kind of in how not to do things, and it's quite interesting. The bit at the end is I find very, very interesting. I'll tell you what, darling, this could be your lucky day. Oh, yeah? If you could answer a simple question, you could be taking me out tonight. Terrific. Here we go, then. What's refreshing, busy, comes in a can, begins with P, ends with I, and you're drinking it. An elephant. That'll do. Where are you taking me? OK. 
Okay, so really the point of that was just to show you, uh, here I'm back again, uh, yeah, just to show you that Pepsi has always been second to Coca-Cola. Um, and the reason is because they have had a policy of, um, and given that Pepsi always comes out better in taste tests, uh, Pepsi always, always beats Coca-Cola hands down in taste tests, it does taste better if you're into those sorts of drinks, which I'm sure none of you are. Uh, but anyway, you'll probably remember them from your childhood beer drink it, let's face it. Uh, but the thing is, you see, they aligned themselves with um, people who were just sort of not particularly doing too well. It was kind of the chap who was down in his luck. I mean, you know, that girl in the advert, she's not in the least bit interested in the poor guy, is she? She's like, oh, just do me a favour, get out of my face. You know, what, what, what is it, darling? It's an elephant, you know. She just doesn't care. She's not interested. But the point is, um, they then, I mean, even recently, they had um, one of the Kardashians. Uh, it wasn't Kim Kardashian. It, it was, um, oh, anyway, one of the mega Kardashians uh, who are famous for being famous. But they aligned their brand with, with one of the Kardashians and they misjudged it so badly because they had her passing a Pepsi to a policeman who was actually taking or, or sort of trying to crowd control during a um, Black Lives Matter rally. Talk about misjudging how to run an advert and how to brand your product. It, uh, with all this money, Pepsi still don't know how to do branding. It is most extraordinary, even though technically they've got a better product. Another brand that is absolutely synonymous with a strap line that has done brilliantly is American Express. We all know the American Express strap line is don't leave home without it. What are they saying to us there? They're not saying anything about it being a credit card. They're not saying anything about the fact that you can put it into a machine or you can use it to pay for things. It can give you money. You can get traveler's text. You can do all sorts of things with this card. They're just saying this thing is so indispensable, whatever it is, that you must not leave home without it. And that strap line, that phrase, don't leave home without it, has just kind of gone into our psyche, hasn't it? It's just one of those things that we all know. So what about other brands that you would think are just um, almost counterintuitively successful? Here we've got uh, Stella Artois. I think their advertising is, is profoundly interesting. Um, this one here is uh, a, this is a Brazilian one. It's not a glass, it's a chalice, if you please. Come on, gentlemen, haven't you got mansions to go to? This one here, let's just grab these and get these out of the way. It says, give beautifully. Stella Artois at Christmas even actually turned their bottle and they actually put their beer into a champagne bottle with the little champagne cage at the top and, and so on to really emphasize the fact that their beer isn't just beer. My shout, he whispered. So, you know, so, so the point is that, you know, you're so sophisticated and you're so laid back, you don't even have to push yourself forward because the fact is you're going to buy everybody a round of Stella Artois, which is terribly expensive. Okay, um, this one is great. We've made great progress in the last 50 years. We were expensive. Now we're exorbitant. <laughs> so you can see where they're going with this. And of course, the chosen one. Oh, <laughs> it's always sort of got light coming out of the top. You expect angels to go, ah, oh. <laughs> reassuringly expensive. I'm sure you know their strap line. But you know, it is just beer. It's no different to Heineken. It's no different to Foster's. The process is the same. The ingredients are the same. It's all about branding. And we can even brand, of course, with uh, the worst brand in the world, but with a jingle. We all know that jingle. We all, you know, as soon as we hear da 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 da, we know, unfortunately, because it's just ingrained in our psyche, that that's McDonald's. And um, so branding can be visual, it can be musical, it can be, um, it can be uh, spoken, it can be pictures. It's a very interesting thing. So let me just take this down and pop this over there for a sec. Right, so what is branding? It's a system of identifying a product, service, person or company as unique, different from the competition. Um, and this can be called positioning. 
So branding can also be defined as the experience that your target audience get when they come into contact with your brand, product or service. So what we're trying to do in branding is to uh, appeal to hearts and minds. So I want you to think about what the tacit implications are of your branding. I would love you, if you wouldn't mind, to do some homework. I would love to look at what you are offering, what your website says about you, what your brochures, if you have them, say about you. Do they all reflect the same brand values? Are they slightly different? What about your business cards, if you have them? Um, what are all the different brand assets out there saying about you? And are they congruent with the message that you want to convey? I'm not going to over egg that because we're going to learn a little bit more about all of those concepts. But here's the feeling. This is, pay attention to this, but particularly towards the end, I want you to think about the feeling that we get from this advert. Shop's open now, Mummy. Now, what shall I have? I've got some nice biscuits. Yes, please. Because we're washing that liquid. No. Don't think I'll buy that. Why? I've missed my fairy moons. What's madness? Kindness, caring, the way fairy bubbles help keep my hands. They feel nice. Yes. My hands just wouldn't trust anything else. Can I have your fairy then, Mummy? Why? Tell me. So I can sell it to my shop. Now hands that do dishes can feel soft as your face. With my green, Okay, so the point was, it was all about feeling, wasn't it? There was nothing Shut about spare now, with me one set. Ah, what shall I have? I got this some nice just biscuits. here. Yes, please. Because I'm watching that liquid. No. Don't think I'll buy that. Why? I've missed my fairy moons. Oh, What's for madness? Kindness, caring, the way fairy bubbles. What is it? It's not washing up liquid, it's kindness, caring. It's the way my hands feel. Uh, you see, so it's all about, it's all about feelings. And this is what we're conveying. Let me jiggle myself over here again now. <laughs> All right, here we are. So what is a brand identity? So I think we've understood the fact that what we've got to do is to get uh, the idea of feelings across. And what we now need to do is we've got to understand um, what the brand identity is. It's the expression of how you want your business to perceive be perceived, I should say. You can develop this in various ways. Your brand identity can be your name. You could be your logo. It could be your marketing communications, your trademarks, if you have them. All of these are things or assets. They are the gestalt of which that must convey a feeling, again, to capture hearts and minds. So again, if you want to use this as a little checklist whilst you're doing the homework that I suggested earlier, look at the, your name or your business name, your logo, if you have one. Now, logo development, is a again a topic all by itself we could do a complete tutorial just on logo and uh, design um, so if you're interested in that I'm more than happy to do it I can geek out on it all day long and it is fascinating truly truly fascinating your marketing communications um, so what are the media that you are using don't forget um, that the media that you use is also part of the message so you know are you on YouTube are you using YouTube as your free shop window to be able to communicate with people if you're doing that what sort of an image are you conveying um, in that shop window again your website is another shop window for you are you just have just got a static website with words and pictures on it or have you got video on your website i strongly suggest you get video on your website because in complementary medicine you are actually the brand now it's really important for you to remember that because the thing is people are coming to you as practitioners now of course i'm aware that we also probably have people in the room who are running training schools as well and many of our practitioner members at the cma also actually uh, run training schools um, so if you are doing both i appreciate that you may not want yourself to be the brand um, you might actually prefer that you have a sort of a brand identity for your school, in which case you're talking about logos and typography and so on. So um, also think about trademarks. Do you have a trademark? Is it worth uh, registering your brand as a trademark? Personally, I think it is if your brand is big enough. Um, so 
the gestalt of all of those is what we're trying to look at. Now, what we need to do is we've also got to think of brand identity being a system. What it does is that it incorporates your logo design and a coherent system of supporting brand assets such as secondary brand marks if you have them, official brand patterns, icons and more. When you're creating any kind of marketing campaign, um, always refer to a brand manual to ensure your brand identity stays consistent. Now big companies pay advertising agencies and creative agencies many many hundreds of thousands or millions of pounds even to create great big books called um, brand manuals and what brand manuals do is that they uh, you would if you were deciding that you were going to run a your company running a campaign let's say you are uh, I don't know um, fairy liquid and you want to run a new advertising campaign and you're going to a new agency uh, for your creative, what you'll do is you'll give them your brand manual. It has your exact colours um, right down to the different ways that colours are described and expressed on um, RGB, CMYK, um, uh, web safe colours and uh, Pantone colours and so on and so forth. So that the colour remains the same across every single incidence of that colour, be it on a computer, be it in print, be it um, on a, a phone, be it on a pad and so on. So everything is cohesive right across the board. So that's what a brand manual does. Now I'm not suggesting that you go and create a massive great book that's a blooming great brand manual because it would take you forever. But I do suggest very strongly that you sit down and say, okay, so this is the way I want my brand to look. These are my assets. This is my logo. Um, this is the typography that I use. I'm going to talk about typography in a moment. This is the uh, layout that I like to use. These are the colours I have on my website. These are the fonts I use. Um, and just make a note of it so that if you do decide to work with a designer at some point down the line, you can actually just hand them the document and say, well, here you go, this is it. It will save you tons and tons and tons of time and it will ensure that your brand stays cohesive. So what exactly is a brand image? Let me move us out of the way over here again. <laughs> All right. So the next piece of the branding puzzle is the brand image, which is how your company or your practice or your school is really viewed by the public. This may or may not be consistent with your chosen brand identity. So how do we find out? You can usually identify this by paying attention to customer feedback, surveys or focus groups. Now at the CMA, we have just migrated over to MailChimp for our email sending system and um, we find that it's really very good because uh, what e uh, MailChimp does is it does send emails very very well it's very intuitive it's a very easy system to use if you can click and drag and drop you can use MailChimp um, but what it also has are wonderful um, surveys and, and things like that now we did a survey with um, CMA members last week, uh, which was so unbelievably useful. Once I've got this session out of the way, I'm then going to go back and actually, uh, we, we've already looked at the answers, but we are going to respond to everybody um, in general, um, because the feedback that we got from you was so superb. It confirmed a lot of our beliefs about our brand, and we also had people suggesting things that we sort of sat up and we thought, actually, do you know what, that's a really, really good idea. And then with the best one in the world, don't forget, I've been looking at this brand for the last 20, actually, I've been looking at this brand for 30 years because the CMA concept was born 30 years ago. We launched 27 years ago. So I've been looking at this brand for 30 years now. So it's very easy. You know what it's like when you can't see the wood for the trees? Um, you know, you can just keep looking at your brand, looking at your brand, looking at your brand, thinking, okay, it's fine, it's fine. And actually not seeing things. So it's very useful to be able to do um, focus groups or surveys or, or just ask people. But my word of caution is, so if you are looking for feedback about your brand, remember that you really need to ask people who are your target market or your ideal client or your students. Because if you go and ask your mummy and your auntie and your dad and your uncle and the next door neighbour, these are not your target market. So they may go, oh yes dear, that's really pretty. I really like it. Oh, I like that flower you've got there. That's not actually telling you anything about the effectiveness of your brand or your branding. So you've got to make sure that the people that you are seeking the opinions of and the wisdom of are the people that you really want to attract. Does that make sense? Yep. Good. Okay.
So brand consistency, let's move over here a bit. <laughs> okay, so when your brand identity is inconsistent with your brand image or values, it may be time for a rebrand. I'm gonna talk about that a little bit later, in a bit more depth. Uh, but right now, the best way to keep ahead of this is all to have a brand manual, as I said, that you can refer back to frequently as you craft your brand messages for various platforms and media. Now, this is where your brand manual may come in very helpful. If you are not working with a creative partner, let's say an advertising person or what have you, and let's face it, most of us won't be. Um, if you're in practice yourself, chances are that you're going to be doing everything yourself. If you've got your brand, your homemade brand manual in front of you, when it comes to running things like Facebook ads, if that's something that you choose to explore, then have your brand manual in front of you so that you know that you're using the right imagery, the right shade of of um, font, the right type of font, that everything is cohesive. Because quite honestly, if you go out with something looking one way and you're directing people to your website and they turn up on your website and everything looks completely different, there's no brand cohesiveness across the two different platforms. So what will happen is that you'll automatically create a disconnect in the person's head and your, um, your conversion rates will be lower. Conversion rates are those rates whereby people, uh, we, we measure conversion as how many people actually clicked and came through to the website. That's one conversion. Another conversion is how many people got to the website and then clicked to actually read more. How many people then clicked to buy or, or and, 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 and. So those are all different levels of conversion rates. Ideally, your uh, click rate should be no more than two clicks for the person to actually be able to get to where they want to be. Okay, very, very, very useful information when you're thinking about creating a website. So what I want to do now is I want to deconstruct the CMA logo for you because I thought it was going, it was very interesting to explain what the logo is, why it is as it is, uh, what the thinking is behind it, um, what the neuro neurological pathways are behind the CMA logo. It's not just a pretty picture. We are actually doing neurological work um, on people that actually view this image. So what we started off with was an image that I really have loved for many, many years. It is, of course, Da Vinci's Vitruvian Man there in the centre. Um, I like it anyway. I'm a massive Da Vinci fan, let's face it, who wasn't? Um, and I've always found this image incredibly compelling, the idea of squaring the circle, which is such an old alchemical idea, isn't it? Um, the idea that uh, things can come out of things, things can fit into things, things can transmute. Um, and that's where the alchemical side of things uh, come in. Um, the fact is that he's a, he's a human being. He's a, very, he's a strong man. He's um, almost the perfect specimen of, 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 of manhood, of health and well-being and so on. Um, it was actually a self-portrait. Uh, so, you know, maybe this is how he actually looked. I don't know how flattering he was being. But so, so I always loved that image. So I wanted to incorporate it because I felt it spoke to the idea of health and well-being. Um, so that was that. And then uh, I was sitting with my ex-husband and um, we were not ex exes at that point. We were actually on a business trip to New York and we were sitting uh, in the it was Christmas time and we were sitting in the cafe right next to the skating rink at the Rockefeller Center. And we were looking at all of the architecture, real Art Nouveau um, architecture and really being carried away by that and then we kind we looked at a bag that we'd picked up with something in it uh, that we'd bought at the Metropolitan Museum of Art and we looked at their typography and my ex Dave was the uh, formerly the planning director of Ogilvy and Maver the world's largest advertising um, agency after that he was then headhunted to be above the board so to basically run the entire board at McCann Erickson, the next biggest agency. Um, so everything that I'm sharing with you today is not just off the top of my head. It's actually sort of based on years and years and years and years and years, 27 odd years or so, of being with one of the world's leading admin and learning a thing or two from him. Dave actually uh, conceptualized and, and created this logo. And so all credit to him, credit where credit's due, I always believe. So the typography, which is very elegant, 
This is a typeface called Felix Titling, although we did actually make some changes to it because it's a very classical, very uh, clear and spacious uh, typeface. So we wanted the idea of lots of white space within this logo. But we also wanted to get across the idea that it was intentional. So this is why we've got these guidelines going across and down. These are the guidelines that are used when people create fonts for spacing. So when somebody invents a new font, they actually create all of these guidelines to make sure that all the letters match up and so on. So the idea was also that this was um, an organisation that was in a, in a sense of becoming. Um, the name Complementary Medical Association, or CMA, again, is no accident, I'll be honest with you. I was looking at um, other successful organisations in the health and medicine field, and of course there's the BMA, the British Medical Association. So I was, you know, I was thinking, well, what should this organisation be called? Should it be called the, uh, I was very ahead of my time, the Integrated Medical Association? No, not, not very many people know that, that term. Uh, should it be the Alternative Medical Association? No, because we don't, we're not frightening doctors off and, and so on. We actually want to promote the idea that uh, the two things can and should work together and, and so on. So this is why I came down to the, the name CMA, like the MA. Um, and, and all the other organisations, GNC, of course, this was another organisation that uh, people kind of knew what it did. And, um, you know, and, and so when I did focus groups, and I actually did do focus groups, because don't forget, I was with an ad man. We did focus groups to our target market. And we said to them, give it, bear in mind, the CMA hadn't even been launched at this point. We showed them this logo and we said, the organization is called the Complementary Medical Association. This is the logo. What do you think the organization actually does? And do you know something people could tell us? They said, well, it's a professional organization. Um, it looks after the interests of practitioners. It, it sort of oversees um, our field, our natural health care field, complementary medicine field. Um, oh, it, it's been around for a long time. This is very interesting. People felt it had been around for a long time because, again, the logo is very classical. It looks as though it's been established for a very, very long time. Well, of course, now it has, but back then it was fresh and brand new. But the idea was that we were conveying um, an organisation, the idea that the organisation had substance. And that is, is very, very important. Because, and, and that was the feeling. When we're going back to the idea of feelings, this was the feeling that we wanted to convey classical, respectable substance, an organisation that was coming into being as the font was coming into being and being designed. But, you know, with the idea of the squaring of the circle, so there was that nod to alchemy and the idea of something interesting alternative going on in the background. So that was how the CMA uh, logo came into being. So I hope it's useful for you to know about that. Another interesting thing about this logo is that you'll notice that we are not using black, 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 100% black. This colour in the C and the M and the A and all of the guidelines and even in the Vitruvian man back there, that colour is 80% black. And the reason that we do that is because it's actually softer on the eye. So if we were to use 100% black, what would happen is that that would really stand out and it would be so jarring that it would actually cheapen the look of the brand. So that's why we use 80 to 80 or 85% black, depending on the background that we're putting the logo onto. Is that helpful for you to know all of that? Yeah, okay, good. So let's further examine the CMA brand anatomy because I think this is useful for you to know. What about the typography that we use? Um, I st strongly suggest this for everybody, okay, because this is research-based, again, geeking out about fonts. Um, I've got some absolutely brilliant research pieces that are completely actually bang up to date. I sent something over to uh, Roberta and Megan just uh, a couple of days ago, it's from 2016, but actually I've done, had a chance to do some more research recently. The, dis the discussion is always with font geeks and designers, which fonts work better, which are more legible um, for print and on screen. So what we know from the research is, and, and this is eye tracking research and, and brain monitoring, brain wave monitoring research and so on, is that you use a serif font for print 
and logos and so on. So that's what we use. So if you are actually writing something for use on paper, printed material, use a serif font. A serif is the little twiddly bits on the end. So if you look carefully, and you can see it nice and clearly um, in Felix titling here. Um, I don't know if you can see, can you see my mouse moving? Yeah, oh great, okay, that's great. So you'll see, uh, let's say on the L and on the little ends of the T's, uh, you've got all these little bits that flip up. And the thinking is, and most of the research seems to agree, is that it helps your eye move across a page in print on paper. However, for screen, um, sorry, just to, sorry, let's just finish off with uh, things like, so what we do in CMA, Felix Titling, for the CMA logo and for when we say the Complementary Medical Association, we expand the font. I want to show you something here. Here's a um, basic, um, I think that's actually, I used Calibri. That's a sans serif font, okay? It hasn't got the twiddly bits on it. So that's a sans serif font. That's the Complementary Medical Association written in a sans serif font. It doesn't really stand out. It doesn't really mean anything. It's just words that are written. Whereas if you look at this here, it then becomes actually viably part of a logo because I've put, I've expanded the font um, and it therefore becomes something that you look at and you think, oh, that has significance. It's become significant, whereas this in Calibri is not particularly significant. So think about the types of fonts you use. Now, on screen, it's different. So we will use this, we will continue to use this on screen as part of the CMA logo. But when we're writing on screen, we use a sans serif font, meaning without serif, as in, for example, Verdana. So you've got Verdana uppercase and Verdana lowercase there. You can see it doesn't have any twiddly bits on the end. On screen, because we all are so subject to screen exhaustion, um, it makes things easier for your client or your target um, audience to read things on a phone or on a computer if you have sans serif fonts. The ones I tend to recommend are Verdana, I like Gil Sands, which works very well. And I also like um, Calibri. Calibri is good. Steer clear of Arial. It's just been done to death. And it's quite a long, tall font, which then looks very, very squashed together. So it doesn't have lots of air in it. Um, so just bear with me one second. I'm just going to go and make sure I'm... Right, there we go. Just make sure I've got everybody in here. Okay, let's get rid of them again. All right, more people joining us at this point. Anybody who's just joining, don't worry, there will be a replay. Um, I know that things are totally weird at the moment. Uh, we're just talking about fonts and so on. So um, again, you know, watch this on the replay. It's actually really, really important for you. The other thing I just wanted to say, sorry, everybody, just to finish off that thought, um, was that, um, again, we use 80% black um, on our, in our newsletters and on our website and so on, again, because it's softer and easier on the eye. So you will get people able to read more text. Um, I don't believe in, in making very, very, very text heavy website pages because you know people can't read uh, a lot of text on a website. Here's a very useful tip for you. When you're putting any text on a website, Please bear in mind that people cannot read, and the research shows, can't read easily more than 600 characters width, maximum. To get the best um, uptake in reader reader readability and comprehension, keep your columns to about 450 characters, no more than that, okay? And the other thing I just wanted to show you, absolutely saved my life, these, I got these a couple of days ago because honestly, these, um, these tutorials that I've been preparing for you actually take me about two days, solid screen work to do. I'll show you my, this is my geeky look, okay. Ah, one time five minutes. <laughs> I didn't get them for attractiveness. I got them because they block blue light. Oh my word. The difference these have made. Um, Roberta, if you can remind me, I'll put a link to these because I really strongly suggest everybody gets themselves a pair. If you haven't already, if you, has anybody got one? Put your hand up. Has anybody got a pair of these already? Oh my, please get them. Please, please get them. If you wear glasses um, for reading, you can actually get 
covers for your glasses as well. But I'll put the link up for these because truthfully, they've been literally revolutionary. They think they've enabled me to do a lot more work uh, without getting splitting headaches. Okay, so let's talk about what your physical brand assets are. Now, physical brand assets are the things that people come into contact with. So again, using the CMA as a really good example, because we're such an established brand, so why not you, you learn from what, we, uh, what you've been doing. When, with our branding, what we want our members to have is an experience that is fully congruent with the CMA brand ethos when they receive and open their membership packs, for example. So our packs feel extremely expensive, um, meaning that they've got gravitas. Uh, the medium is the message, don't forget. So if we were going out with little flimsy bits of horribly photocopied paper, that would inf infer that our organisation is substandard. So we go out with heavy cream paper, we pay a lot of money to ensure that it's recycled, eco-resourced and recyclable and so on. We send out a really nice pen that everybody loves. It's eco-friendly, eco-produced um, and recyclable. We send, we're now going to be sending out an ID card, um, a beautifully designed CMA membership certificate on a really nice, heavy, substantial card. We're going to be sending you a new booklet, info sheets and CPD booklet. Uh, and practice assets and more. So let's just go, so let me go back to all of that. So all of those, all of those things in the pack are what we call points of contact. In your brand, points of contact are your website, your business card, your brochure if you have one, anything that you have that is essentially part of what you send out, part of what you give to people. They're all points of contact. All of those need to be congruent across the board. So CMA corporate assets, why do, we do, why do we spend so much time putting so much hard work into them? Um, the thing is that you feel, it's going to back to that idea of feeling, you know, the, the fairy liquid and the Chanel perfume versus the Charlie perfume. And all those adverts I showed you earlier, the gorilla is feeling as he's just about to get into that drum solo. That's such a great ad. You feel the CMA difference as soon as you make contact with us in any way. We are practitioners, we know what you're going through, um, we know how your world works. We can answer your questions quickly, accurately and efficiently. We promote the fact that we are a non-profit organisation, global leader. Our strap lines are excellence and professionalism. Please feel free to borrow any of this. Um, this is all here for you. It's given to you freely as our way of supporting you during COVID and beyond. If anything here appeals to you and resonates with what you're doing, Borrow it, please, with, by all means. Um, we promote our governmental activity, conventional medical liaison, very important, our preference for evidence-based approaches to healthcare and the information we disseminate, our media activity, and lastly, that we are not an insurance company or similar, masquerading as a professional membership body. There are organisations out there that are actually <coughs> So you've just got to bear in mind that uh, CMA exists, completely transparency, run by practitioners, for practitioners and training schools and approved suppliers and fellows of the CMA and your students and so on. So, you know, it really is um, run for the right reasons. This is, this is the real key issue here. Everything that we do, every point of contact, even our answering machine message is on brand. So please make an inventory of all of your points of contact for your business and examine how each of these represents your brand. If you are too close to it, get somebody who is your target audience to take a look at it for you and tell you what it means to them. What's the feeling they get? Not what they think you do um, as a result of what they're looking at, but what is the feeling that that accrues to them when they look at what you are putting out there. So we've had lots of uh, CMA brand cohesion across the years, and I'll pop us all down there for a moment. Uh, 
CMA stands, we used to um, partake in or participate in something wonderful called Can Expo. And so you can see, you know, we were never backward in coming forward when uh, slapping our, our logo up there. I mean, my goodness, anything that could have a logo on it, add a blooming logo on it. Even if you look at, uh, this is my mum, Jill, and this, and I'm looking after my mum at the moment. This is why I'm in front of the background. I'm actually mummy's living room at the moment because she's, she's not been doing brilliantly uh, during all of this so I've actually come to look after her and uh, so I'm doing lots of cooking and lots of, of lovely things for mummy and gardening and whatnot but you know you can see them both wearing these lovely um, scarves that we made and um, the, even the scarves had brand logos on them and they had that purple edging around them that was the same as the stand colour. Yes, we have a specific uh, Pantone colour and an RGB colour and a CMYK colour. If any of this jargon means nothing to you and you want to ask me afterwards, remember that uh, we, you know, you can ask, we, we will have time for questions at the end, so just make notes in the notes section. So as you can see, across the years we've been incredibly coherent. Um, so what is just thinking about brand awareness. Brand awareness is the extent that customers recognize your brand and they associate it with the service or product they want to buy. So you establish brand awareness by ensuring that every touch point is on brand and cohesive across all media. I know I'm repeating myself, but as you know, um, a lot of us actually uh, take information in and then immediately forget it after we then move on to the next thing. So the point, and I know I'm repeating this, but it's so, so important that you, that you, you maintain cohesiveness. And we also need to develop brand loyalty. So while advertising and marketing plays a huge part in developing name recall, one should not ignore the quality of your product and a customer's experience with it. How do you find out about that? Well, you ask them. If clients are happy with what you have to offer, they will become your advocates and spread your brand through word of mouth, which is the most powerful form of marketing there is. It's free. So it, that, ergo, it's the best form of advertising. And people buy products from people like them. We're far more likely to buy a product or a service from a friend or a family member or somebody whose opinion we respect um, than by some stranger standing on television and telling us to buy it. Um, so this is actually one of the reasons why um, influence marketing is now so incredibly important to advertisers because influencers have suddenly sprung up as being people who are in some way relatable to that particular target market and if they say oh this is a great product I'm using it then chances are that all of that person's followers who relate to that person, don't forget, this is all so very specific, it's all about relating and feelings, they will actually go ahead and buy that product. Um, and so, you know, your brand, your loyal followers, your loyal clients are actually your brand ambassadors. Think of them that way. So who are your biggest brand fans? Many entrepreneurs, practice, uh, practice owners, uh, practitioners, training schools, many entrepreneurs are focused on constantly pursuing new clients. Personally, I think that is a waste of resource. Yes, it's good to keep new students coming into your school or new clients coming over your threshold of course nobody's coming over our thresholds at the moment are they but I'm speaking figuratively so if you're the type of practitioner who's been able to take their, their, uh, their practice online well you are able to get new clients but the point that I'm going to make is that you must never forget or overlook your most loyal clients um, how do you identify your most loyal clients well <laughs> grab that and Okay, one step. There we go. Um, so what we do here is we need to find out who these people are and we need to understand Pareto's law. Now, Pareto or Pareto's law is that it's the 80, also known as the 80-20 law. Okay, so what does that actually mean in practice? Well, what it means is that 20% um, of your clients or your students will actually bring 80% of your business. Okay, so what, let me try and get this so that I'm... Okay, one second. 
Right. Okay. <clears throat> so yeah. So um, yeah. Eighty percent of uh, so eighty percent of your business will come from twenty percent of your clients. It's one of those rules, and it's a cliche, but it's a cliche because it's true, and it does actually uh, hold water. So back again. Okay. So once you've narrowed your clients down to a very narrow demographic range, you can begin to ask the questions that will help you to create more customers just like them, because that's what we need to do. If we understand that that top 20% best performing clients or students, if you're running a school, are the ones that you really need to target because they are your most active, your most loyal, they are your best advocates. What we want to do is to find ways of actually attracting more of those. Now I've written a lot about this and made videos in Jamie Goddard masterclasses over on in, at the Facebook group. If you're not a member of that Facebook group, I do strongly suggest that you go and join it ASAP. Loads of great videos and loads of great workbooks there for you. Um, so what we've got to do is we've got to understand what made those people brand fans or made those brand fans customers in the first place. What keeps them coming back? And what about your brand is appealing to them? Knowing this crucial information will help you to add more people to your base of fans or customers or clients. However, it will help you in another important task, which is keeping these people happy because it is cheaper and less energy sapping to keep your existing clients happy rather than having to consistently go and hunt for new business. That is expensive, it's exhausting, and so I would say look at where your business is coming from currently and look at keeping them happy as well. Oops. Okay, so why should you work hard to keep those loyal fans happy? Of course, it's simply the right thing to do. Now, here's my big bugbear. Um, I was a BT customer for 30 years or so, probably more, more actually, 40 years, something like that. Um, a very loyal customer, I think you would uh, um, uh, would agree. I'd never missed a bill, you know, just a really, really, really loyal customer. Um, they had some great offers coming out. Um, so I phoned up BT and said, look, I've been with you for 30 years. Uh, you've got this great new offer coming out and it would really reduce my bills. Could I possibly? Oh, no, sorry, madam. It's only for new customers. I was absolutely flabbergasted. I was really, really off actually I thought that was rude I thought it was really obnoxious not to reward existing customers so um, I just migrated elsewhere I went to a different company um, ignoring the people who are your business's bread and butter while focusing on the new kids on the block is simply unfair I'm sure you'll agree clients who observe this pattern will likely become bitter and disillusioned as I did with BT um, further, it's, as I said earlier, it's exponentially more difficult to get a new customer than to, than to keep an existing one. Uh, wooing your brand fans makes good sense from a fiscal point of view as well as an ethical one. So not only will identifying and romancing your biggest brand fans bring you greater profits and encourage law behaviour, it will cut back on your day-to-day -day headaches as well. Um, I don't know if you would agree, but are you not just tired of appeasing difficult clients if you get them? Wouldn't you rather be dealing with people who are generally happy with your brand and your services? By knowing who these people are and why they love your business, you can more easily identify and market specifically to others just like them. Focused marketing efforts such as this are always more successful than broad peppergum approaches and they are usually more inexpensive as well. So let's talk about relationships. Once you've identified your brand fans and understand what makes them keep coming back, you will be well on your way to business success. When you establish the value of your brand and benefits that accrue to your clients, they are not going to jump ship ship for a cheaper alternative as soon as the economy takes a dip. They've formed a relationship with your brand, with you, because generally speaking in practice you are the brand, which is the whole point of your investment in marketing and branding activities. So if you remember earlier, right at the very beginning of this, I spoke about the idea of Me Too brands. So there's a nutritionist over there, a nutritionist over there, a nutritionist over there, we're all nutritionists. But if you make yourself different, if you differentiate yourself in a particular way, we're going to come on to that in a moment, this is where people will be attracted to your brand, you'll get the right clients for you, or if you're school, you're teaching a course, you're teaching a course on, let's say, homeopathy, 
for example. There's another course doing homeopathy. There's another course. There are hundreds of courses doing homeopathy. Why should yours be the one that people go to? That's, that's the art of branding. So the, the way it happens is because you establish brand value. So the idea behind brand value is what do you bring to the party that is completely different from everybody else out there? How do you want your brand offering to be perceived? What are the feelings that you want people to have? We spoke about feelings earlier. Study, as I said earlier, your top 20 demographics, psychographics, geographics, if that's relevant for you. Use tools such as Facebook lookalike audiences. Now, let's just uh, break that last bit down there. Study your top 20 demographics. Remember Pareto's law? Your top 20% best forming clients are the ones who will be the ones that are bringing in up 80% of your business. So what you need to understand about them is who they are. What magazines do they read? These are things like psychographics. Um, what, what clubs do they belong to? Again, psychographics. What do they like? Um, where do they live? If that's relevant to you, if you have a bricks and mortar practice or you have a bricks and mortar school, um, obviously when we're back open after COVID, you'll need to consider demographics and, and geographics because you're going to need to target people who are similar to the people that you already have, but also people in a specific area. So that's geographical targeting. And using tools such as Facebook lookalike audiences. If you have a Facebook professional page, and if you don't have one yet, please go and get one. It's very, very important because when you start attracting the right kind of people to that Facebook page, what will happen is you will then be able to go into Facebook and say, dear Facebook, I would like to run an advert. Even if you don't want to run an advert, you go in and you start to set up an advert. And what Facebook knows about people is actually really quite scary. Um, you can say, I want to target people who are this age, live in this neighborhood, um, read this magazine, this magazine, they follow this particular Facebook page, uh, they like this website, they like that, they drive this kind of car, their income is this, um, they've got uh, four children, they do this, they like hockey, they like uh, netball, they, li they like vegan food. You can actually put all of those parameters in, uh, obviously it being relevant to your offering of course, um, goes without saying, and, and people like that will actually pop up. Um, on in, in your Facebook uh, group. I'm just going to admit more people. Okay. Hello, people who have just been admitted to the group. I'm sorry it's taken you a while to get in, but there is a recording. Okay. So please don't worry. Please don't think that you are missing out because you're not. Right. We'll be able to access the recording later. Let me just um, get rid of the this little box. Hang on. Let me just uh, shrink that down. Let me get rid of that. Okay, let me take that down there. Okay, get that out of the way. That's chat. All right, so um, understanding your avatar is really crucial when it comes to working out your demographics, psychographics, geographics, and so, and so on. Over at Janie Goddard Masterclasses, I did a whole training on avatar identification. In short, your avatar is the ideal client. It's the person that you would most really love to target. It's the person who is your dream client. Okay, so go and take a look at that avatar training. Um, it's incredibly useful for you. So, okay, let's come back here. Um, and finally, understanding your niche is incredibly important. Who are the types of people that you want to teach, uh, to, to uh, treat? Are they pregnant ladies? Are they mums who've just had babies? Are they people who've just got engaged? Are they people who play rugby? Are they people who really like music? You know, think about the type of niche that you want to work in, or if you're running a training school or a college, think about the niche that you are really specialising in with your particular courses. The more you can niche down, the tighter you can actually create your ideal person or or target, if you like, um, the more likely you are to be successful with your marketing and your branding. If you go really broad, you're then trying to be all things to all people. And honestly, that then becomes so nebulous that it ends up not saying anything to anybody. Lastly, if you can answer WIFM, which stands for what's in it for me, you are winning. This 
actually helps you to craft a statement about the transformation that you offer. Now, what do I mean by that? We're all in practice or we're all offering trainings. Now, ultimately, when anybody makes a buying decision, before they make that buying decision, i.e. making an appointment to come and see you as a practitioner or make a, a Skype consultation with you or, or what have you, or to take one of your courses, what they need to know and what you need to tell them is what's in it for them. You need to be able to explain the benefit that accrues to them by coming to you or the transformation that you offer to use a more marketing term. What is the transformation? So let's say the Complementary Medical Association, what's in it for, what's in it for me? Well, I've looked at this organization, the Complementary Medical Association, why should I join them? What's in it for me? That's what the person wants to know. What, what, do I, what do I gain out of joining this organization? Well, we are then really in your face by saying, excellence, professionalism, get the, get the professional recognition you deserve. All of these strap lines that we have um, accrued over the years that we know really appeal to people. It describes exactly the benefits that they will get. So if you're a reflexologist, what's the transformation that you offer? Um, what's in it for your client? Think of it that way. Let's say you are a homeopath and you're treating um, mums with new babies and the babies. So what's the transformation you offer? Well, it's perhaps addressing issues like colic and teething and, and things like that. So actually, we're not talking about the fact that we treat or, or work with colic or teething because those are named, um, named conditions. Uh, what we would do is we would be conveying the feeling, because we're talking about branding here, to the mum, that the mum is going to have a much, much easier life of things by using your services because you have all the answers that she needs. You've got ways of dealing with all of these problems that can afflict little newborn babies. So though, that's the idea that you are putting across. It's again, please go back to the idea of feeling. So you're not selling the old, old uh, advertising saying was don't sell the sausage, sell the sizzle. So again, it's the feeling, it's the idea, it's the benefit that accrues to the person, not the actual thing. I mean, as a homeopath, I'd be completely mad to say, come to me, I'm a homeopath, I'll give you a white pill in a bottle. Well, yeah, that is what I do. But that's not going to impress anybody, is it? Do you see where I'm going with that? Does that all make sense so far? Yes, are we happy? Everybody, yeah, can you give me a, sh a thumbs up if, if everything makes sense? Good. Okay, lovely. Thank you. All right. So this WIFM, this what's in it for me down the bottom here is absolutely crucial for you to get your head around. As I said, I promised I would touch on pricing. Once you establish the value of your brand, pricing can be structured to follow suit. By all means, research your competitors, but beware of commoditizing your, your, your offering. So if you go out there and look at the, the prices of every other reflexologist in the area and say, well, everybody's charging 50 quid or whatever, 50 quid's a round number. Everybody's charging 50 quid. I too shall charge 50 quid. That commoditizes your offering because it means that you are not actually thinking in any way about establishing and promoting the value that will accrue to the person by using your services. By promoting the value of what you do enables you to price, structure your price completely differently to everybody else out there. Go back to Chanel and Charlie. Chanel can charge a bomb, whereas Charlie can't. Charlie, they're both water in a bottle with some scent in it. It's the same thing, it's the same product, exactly the same thing one is highly desirable and one is just a destroyed brand. So think about ways that you can get the value across of what you do. If through your branding you can establish and communicate a feeling and answer that question, what's in it for me, you can structure your fee to reflect the legitimate, legitimate value that you offer. A question that I'm often asked by practitioners, because you know, we often do lots of different things, is can a company have multiple brands? Well, yes, you can actually. Um, let me take that. 
this down there out of the way briefly. Okay, so yes, you can. Think about car companies. Uh, many companies have different brands for different targeted markets. Car manufacturers, for example, have a luxury brand model for wealthy customers, while at the same time having a low cost brand for customers with smaller disposable incomes. So you've got the, the big Audi and then you've got the sporty Audi, the beast. However, it's very important not to confuse the various brands or end up killing the brand website by overloading them with a lot of visual language. Visual language meaning lots of pictures, lots of bullet points, lots of planes. So if you go onto an Audi website, you'll see in fact that they've got an Audi website that talks about the brand. And then they will take you off in different directions. If you're interested in this SUV type Audi, then they'll take you off in one direction to just a section of their website that only deals with page after page, only deals with how you go about buying one of those and the advantages that will accrue to you. And the languaging and the stylization you, they use there is completely different from the languaging, stylization, and targeting they would use for somebody who navigates towards the R8. Because obviously the R8 is, um, well, it's a very fast car, it's a very, very expensive car. So they're dealing with a very, very different audience. So again, everything, all the brand assets in, on that side of the site are completely different. And you don't get sight of the SUV pages at all. You don't even know that SUV exists because they know that as soon as you get to the site, you're going to pick your direction that you go in. So you, for example, let's say you are looking after mums with new babies and you happen to have discovered that you've got a niche in uh, weekend warrior, rugger buggers, the local rugby club who keep getting injuries and they just come to you because they want some help with their uh, cuts and bruises and they need your sports massage for example. So on one hand you're doing baby massage, the other hand you're doing sports massage. Obviously very very disparate branding messages because your rugger bugger isn't going to really respond to a nice message about your little baby and that lovely how your baby's going to love and develop through having baby massage and your mum who's just had a baby if she looks at a rugger bugger the last thing she wants to do is look at muddy rugger boots isn't it let's face it so you know you think about your messaging and think about how you can split if you're doing various niches if you're working in various niches think about having perhaps more than one website or cleverly splitting your website so that it speaks to different people in, in the right and correct way to elicit the feelings that you want the people to have. Finally, I said we would touch on a rebrand. If you feel that what's, what you're uh, putting out there at the moment is not on message, it's not doing what you need it to be doing, and you may find after this tutorial that you may want to go back and actually make some changes. Has anybody actually felt that? Is anybody feeling that they might actually want to change a few bits and pieces? Yeah, I, I'm not surprised. I, I think, you know, most of us do. And it's always good, always good to look at uh, your branding. In fact, actually, um, with, at the CMA, we've been talking about, we know that we need to completely update our website. Um, the CMA website was amazing when it went up seven years ago. It was brilliant, it's state of the art. Seven years later, Oh my goodness, we looked at it and gosh, it looks so cluttered. At the time it was brilliant, it was groundbreaking. Nobody had a news site like that. Whereas now we looked at it and we go, gosh, you know, that's a lot of information on that site. So we're actually changing, completely changing our website. Um, can't even begin to tell you when the new one will be up. We're only in the design stage at the moment, but it won't be long. But, um, you know, we'll talk you through the actual rebranding of the website. It's quite interesting, I think, to follow those sorts of stories through. So we look at the idea of a rebrand, which is an, a, an effort to rework your brand identity. Why might you do that? Uh, company merger, perhaps you do a joint venture with somebody inconsistent brand identity uh, maybe over the years you know you thought oh I really like that design and then you thought oh gosh yeah so that's in my brochure oh gosh but I really like this business card or oh, I like that picture or oh, I could use this as a logo um, blah, blah, blah. and it all kind of gets a bit messy and, and isn't cohesive um, you could you might possibly change your company's strategy you might be looking at a new target market um, or you may be like Cadbury's and, and various other companies that have had really nasty brand problems and need to completely pivot away from that brand problem, uh, much like the formaldehyde in the milk. Um, Rebranding re must be done very, very carefully. If it's not done right, you might not be able to overcome your previous brand's image problems. But I will say that if you approach branding or even rebranding, um, 
uh, in the way that I've described it in this tutorial by looking at the feelings that you want to evoke in response to your brand and your message that is something that will really stand you in good stead um, I'm not suggesting anybody here has ever had a brand catastrophe but it's a useful um, a useful little bit of mental gymnastics for us to do uh, to always look and, and revisit our branding um, and again in cohesive brand assets again you know as I say if you've done a little bit here twiddle here and twiddle there and twiddle there uh, look at it sit down look at your brand manual that I suggested you create see what you can do to bring everything back together under one image roof that will really help and then go out and test it um, against your target market so uh, speak to your clients speak to your students speak to those people who are your target not to your mum and your dad and your auntie and your next door neighbor and your dog because they're not the target market and they just don't get it they will say oh that's really nice dear that's not the feedback you want it's not uh, helpful another reason may be that it's outdated there are certain elements within the cma branding that we know are outdated particularly the website um, simply because of the speed at which technology advances so almost there i want you to take a deep dive into the world of branding explore the feelings that you can conjure up to appeal to your ideal client let me know how you can help you i'm here for you as always don't be a stranger what else would you like to learn do let me know um, if you're up for a session on logos and typography and getting your brand assets right i'd be quite up for doing one of those for you but i don't want to spend days and days putting all that together if it's not particularly appealing so please would you let me know that that would be really helpful okay so thank you for joining me today um it's been absolutely brilliant these are the ways you can connect with me um over at my private practice development closed facebook group it's called jamie goddard master classes that master classes is all one word because i'm cool and funky like that <laughs> uh, of course at the complimentary medical association facebook page and private members group um, the replay of this will be put up in these it will also be in the cma e-newsletter which comes out every wednesday so you'll be able to click the link to get back to this recording if there's anything that you missed um, you can also connect with me at the complimentary medical association and jamie goddard youtube channels we're putting amazing youtube videos up uh, please join me on those channels um, a tip is particularly with the cma channel um, and my channel as well actually to be fair um, when you want to make sure that you don't miss something from a particular person, and I think really the CMA channel really comes into this category for you guys, you subscribe to the channel and you click a little bell icon next to the subscribe, little red subscribe button. Um, if you click on that and you say all videos, every time we bring out a new video, tutorial video, it will actually let you know, you'll get a notification so you won't ever miss out okay um also like and comment um, like my videos and comment on them because it actually helps them to be seen by other people um and quite honestly the way you know the cma is a non-profit organization so the way that we work is that we want our good work to be out there and seen by as many people as possible so please help with their visibility by liking and commenting on our videos it all helps with ranking we will do the same for you if you have a youtube channel um, just let us know what your youtube channels are and we are more than happy to go over and and like and support you and comment and subscribe and and hit the bell icon and help you rank as well my email is jamie at the cma.org.uk i'm pretty sure everybody knows that um, and the cma office is admin at the cma.org.uk and you probably know our phone numbers um, but obviously if you don't there they are and the cma website of course is the cma.org.uk and finally feel free to um, cannibalize this and, and use this copyright notice everything we do within the cma um, is always copyrighted uh, if you ever need to copyright anything by all means you may copy this copyright notice you have my blessing and permission to do that um, also please note that the cma logo is a registered trademark and property of the cma it's illegal to use it unless you have specific permission to use it uh, obviously if you're a cma member and we have sent it to you that implies that we have given you permission to use it whilst you are still a cma member so right let's get the questions up um here we go lovely and i'm going to right let's get some 
Fabulous, righty ho. So, as I said, everything is recorded, so you won't miss out at all. Let's just get me to that a bit there. Right, okay. Um, let's, I'm just going to go through. I know that Roberta has been wonderful in responding to questions that uh, I, I've not been able to see because it's very difficult for me to present on screen and uh, then also <laughs> um, and then also read questions simultaneously plus operate on my videos and whatnot. Um, I hope you liked the videos. I hope you found that they were actually really uh, educational and appropriate and useful. Um, I think it's really good to show what people do well and what they don't and, and what has worked and hasn't worked in advertising. Um, right, let's have a little look. Oh, so yes, Jane wants uh, typology, typography mm -hmm. and so on. Great, okay. Uh, right, okay, more learning. Yes, okay. Everybody's really enjoying these webinars, I think. That's wonderful, I'm really pleased. It makes it all worthwhile doing because it does take hours and hours to do the research and, and create these things. Um, right, okay, lovely. Yes, have a lovely weekend, everybody. Uh, great, lovely comments. Thank you very, very much. Any more questions? Okay. I think we're okay. Yeah, no, no, I think everybody is great. So what we'll so. do is uh, we will put up a uh, message in the Masterclasses Facebook group. If you've got, so we'll, we'll put a, a stream, so to speak, a thread, a thread, it's called a thread, um, in the Facebook group, Masterclasses Facebook group, um, head on over there and uh, Roberta, would you be able to put that thread up for me, please? Because I've I'll got to, as you know, I've got to do an email and a couple of phone, of uh, meetings after yeah. this now and in, interviews and so on. I'll get that um, organised. Thank you, my love. Yeah, if you can put that under Roberta's thread. Uh, Roberta, if you can just type it something like branding, um, branding tutorial on um, webinar whatever this is called it's, tu it's tutorial i guess <laughs> um, and uh, yeah and and so if you've got any questions you can always do drop them in there now or you can always come back to it if you suddenly think oh darn it i should have asked xyz so look i've kept you for long enough now thank you so much for every being with me everybody it's absolutely wonderful stay safe and well be good and i shall see you soon take care lots of love to all bye bye